step at a time. <laughs> I got a hard stop in my yes. Yeah, I, yeah, I think we're all going to try to okay. yeah. expedite. I would be good. All right, too. Thank you. Wrap it up, of course. I definitely don't think we'll get you in the whole of this. Yeah. So. Well, and she said that. Right? Oh, it's just in order. It's in order. I'll put the uh, presentation here. Okay, I think you can get started <coughs> and then we'll catch up with you. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone that can see us to the October 7th, 2022 Long Range Planning Committee meeting. Uh, we're here in the Public Safety Building. Um, we do have a long agenda today, so I uh, apologize for getting late. Those of you that have stuck with us, um, one member of the public, I think, here, maybe speaking later, speaking again. Um, agenda for tonight for tip this morning. Uh, first item is to review minutes of September 2nd. Moved to approve. Second, any comments? All in favor? I think we have four voting members Peter, Allen, Marvin, myself. That's a five voting members. Second item on here is something I think has been uh, the back of a lot of our minds lately is uh, the status of the comprehensive plan um, review with the state. And I know this was ended um, autumn. Do you have some updates? Any so public update or what's it? What well, was? Oh, well, yes, <laughs> it was on screen. We were so close. <laughs> Basically, and Karen has been reaching, working with the state, um, and I put in your, uh, I don't know if you all had a chance to review the slideshow, just do from the beginning, and then, or if that's fine, and put, there you go. Right. So Karen reached out to the state on August 5th, and I put in quotes what we have, uh, apologies for my delay, it looks like you've worked through a lot of the issues. So we're still waiting on uh, Tom to get back to us from the state. He is the only reviewer, so he does the entire state, and he has a long list. If you go to the website, you can see all of the communities and towns and cities that are working on this right now. So uh, I think we're in good shape, but we are, that is what we have. Um, we are next in line. They were doing <laughs> Rockland or Rockford. Mm -hmm. And, you know, <laughs> the difference, what we did is it, the original version, um, the, the state was trying to map, they have this long outline of the things that need to be in the plan and the policies and all of that. And they were trying to go back to different pages. And what we did to help them out, um, because they came back and said, well, we couldn't find this, we couldn't find that, and we would tell them where it was. And so we did something that we thought was a little simpler for them to review, <laughs> is we took all of the state policies and um, guidelines that we, were supposed to, that we were supposed to follow and did. And then I just copied the excerpts directly <clears throat> into a table for that, for the comp plan. And then there are a couple of things um, that were in that, that um, description or the, the details, things that, we are, that are standard policy for us, like having um, a code officer and things like that. We don't necessarily say it's a goal to have a code officer because we have a code officer and have forever in a day. So when we came across a couple of those types of things, we just went back and explained that. You know, it's not a goal, it's not an action in the plan because we have an existing code officer, have had for, you know, decades. So, um, and so that's where they found it a little easier to try to um, make sure that we are in performance. Uh, so that's, that's the difference. And as soon as they went back to us, he did an initial reading of that and felt like he really covered everything. 
but you know, devil's in the details, he needs to go back and, and um, sign off. So hopefully next month we'll have a full official really go. And then it will go come back to us. Comments will have been adjusted and it will go to the council. Definitely. It'll go to the council because it's a certification. The only um, the only reason it would need to go back to the council for any action is if they asked us to change, change something. Yeah. And that's possible. They could ask us to add something or clarify something. And if they do that, then we would we would make those edits as long as they made sense to us. Mm -hmm. And that would go back to the council for approval. Okay. So if someone said, can I speak at this What you say? Well, you speak up, please. Please. It's the 2021. That's a downtime. No, what I mean is, it, is it deemed effective even though it hasn't been approved by the state? So, until, because uh, I reviewed the, the state law this week. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, what it says is that, that <clears throat> we needed to do a comprehensive plan um, that was consistent with the state. And the only time they would deem it inconsistent is if we got a finding from the state or the court of law said we were inconsistent. But as long as you know, we've made our best effort to follow the state policy. We've submitted it for certification. We have no findings of inconsistency. So the 2021, 2021. is the active correct live conference. <clears throat> correct. Okay. Correct. 2006 is no longer on the books. Correct. Yeah. So Dave, I had a quick question. <clears throat> Karen, if I may, thank you. Um, was there any substantive feedback? You know, from them, because I had heard something about we had a different number of strategic imperatives than the guideline. That's the only other thing that I've heard other than the general feedback we had. Right. So, so what they were concerned about um, from an initial quick read, and that, just to be clear, they never finished. They did not actually review the plan because um, they left. They stopped at a certain point. Um, there were some. Um, Areas that he said, well, I don't understand and I don't see, I see a policy over here, but I don't see it in the implementation table. And so if that happened, if, if I knew about that in this table that I reworked for them, what I did is I, I reworked it and just put it in the table and said, here's where it is and here's how we're addressing. They they're really want everything to have that, you know, in the back where we have who's responsible, and what's the time frame and all of that? Everything has to have one of those. So that's what we did. Make sure we consistent that way. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Wait patiently. It's fun. Uh, item three: discuss and provide input of the light industrial road and rural front farming overlay zoning district and home road. Yes, and so if you go to the next slide, this will show you, this is the area that we're talking about, uh, just west of the Turnpike Homes Road there on the north, uh, the old uh, race track, and then there's quite a bit of uh, vacant property, the town property there, the old landfill. Miss Hamilton is here, I believe, to speak to this one as well. So if we get, if you find yourselves, uh, I know public comment is at the end, but she is here to speak to this one. If you okay. find yourself wanting to get that out. Okay. Um, Eric, if you'll go to the next slide, please. So these are the questions and issues that we've been asked to answer, move forward, uh, consider. So vehicular access, the zoning district itself uh, has some concerns as far as uh, two rod road. There are two large parcels that are essentially landlocked with the way the ordinance was written. Uh, the zoning overlay boundary, should it remain as is, or should we adjust it? You'll find when we go through the next slides, the uh, there is a, the light industrial district, and then there is a rural farming overlay on the portion of it. So that's one of the questions. And then traffic, which is really a bigger picture for track, truck access, because we also have truck access coming from the west. So those are the questions to think about, and I'm going to go through what we have <coughs> on the maps and what we have in the ordinance, and then talk about what maybe potential could happen to change this. Eric, we'll go to the next one. So in 2013, there's about 500 acres. It's the light industrial, uh, it's the purplish gray on there. 
includes the Beachman Speedway, the town landfill site, there's an auto salvage yard, and then there's the residential properties <coughs> along Two Broad Road. The rural farming overlay was also included in 2013. You'll go to the next one, Eric. Um, you can see down there on the south portion. So there's residential properties, and then there's two large properties owned. I believe the name is uh, Kian. Uh, yeah. Kian, yeah, thank you. Um, so this was all done in 2013. And the next slide, um, the purpose was to provide, I believe at the time, you know, almost 10 years ago, we were sort of running low on industrial property and thinking about setting aside some areas um, and then some redevelopment potentially for the, the racetrack. So this was the purpose and this is what's in our ordinance right now. Um, and then the residential properties, it was the desire to protect those. So that's why that overlay was put into place. So the next slide, uh, shows you what's happened since 2013. I thought that was important to see what's happened in the last 10 years. Um, so these are numbered. So the numbers go with the permits that we received or any redevelopment applications. So for instance, number 40, that is the salvage area. Uh, there's just a new CEO. We've had a couple of those things, some renovations. We did have number 69 north of um, Holmes Road. We had um, an approved master plan for trailer rental earlier this year, but we haven't come back. I haven't come back with anything else for that. And then number seventy, that's the large one, um, the racetrack. Of course, they did do a site inventory and analysis last year, uh, earlier this year, but we haven't seen that come back either. So this is what's happened um, in the light industrial properties in the last ten years, just for some perspective on the uh, trailer rental on property on that lot 69 you got there um what do you mean by trailer rental is it like industrial trailers i think it was yes <coughs> just like a yeah. light industrial <coughs> shipping containers yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. No, which, not which trailer homes that whether that's improved use and so okay. if you'll go to the next slide eric um these are the ones that i added for the residential properties um so 161 there was a zba granted practice difficulty, um, single family building permit, shed, 165, a CO sign, a renovation, um, and then 167, which I believe is Ms. Hamilton's property, uh, renovation, and then CBA for a home business. So you've seen some activity, but you haven't seen massive redevelopment of the area. You haven't seen a light industrial business park go in. You haven't seen perhaps what was anticipated in 2013 when this was all, and I, I wasn't here for sure, but I, I don't know if we've seen what we really uh, intended or what we thought was gonna happen. So that's just the perspective of what's there. So the- Can you go back to that yes. moment? When you said there, there are two significant landlocked- um, It's lots. the two green that no activity has gone on to. They don't, they're vac it's vacant parcels. So it's okay, the, 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 those two the, large pieces. And they're in the rural farming overlay. Correct. Okay. Yeah. They do have signs up. For sale. I'll say, and, and when you say they're landlocked, what's I'll show. I'll tell you about how it works through the ordinance because it's a little, it's a little com complicated to get there, but it's the way the ordinance is written. Um, so the light industrial portion, and, and if I go too fast, it's I know it's early, and I've had a lot of coffee, so you guys just <laughs> stop me. Feel free. Um, the light industrial uses are divided into two different sections. So. There's all lots and then there's frontage on the home. So all lots, you can do these things, personal service establishments, business services, contractors offices, more of really your general commercial type use. You can do this on Holmes Road, Two Rod Road, any new, new roads. So go to the next slide, Eric. So your light industrial uses are listed as only with Holmes Road now. And so uh, that's where you get the manufacturing, the technology, warehousing, the trailer sort of use. Those sorts of things can go on Holmes Road access only. So there's a long list of those, but it's basically general business, commercial on all roads, and then your light industrial is focused on Holmes Road. So go to the next slide, Eric. So then you have um, space and bulk requirements. Uh, 
minimum lot areas, minimum frontage. So frontage on the Holmes Road and Two Rod Road, the minimum is 200 feet. If you create any new streets, it's 100 feet. There's setbacks, um, so they consider 100 foot side and rear for if there's any abutting to residential. So the setbacks are in pretty good shape. And then the maximum height is 45 feet. So the next one, there's also a streetscape buffer strip. And I know this starts to get complicated. There's a lot of details and you have to kind of go through the details to figure out what really applies to properties. Uh, so Holmes Road, which is that north piece, there's a 30 foot buffer strip required for landscaping. Two Rod Road, there's a 100 foot buffer strip required and you can't have access off of it um, for those flat industrial uses. If you're on the main turnpike, there's a 100 foot buffer strip. Other new streets would be 10 foot. And this buffer strip would just be a naturally vegetated landscape in accordance with the site plan review. So Holmes Road and other streets can have driveways cutting through this buffer strip. Um, but Two Rod Road, if you don't have access there now or before 2013, <coughs> access is prohibited for Two Rod Road. So that, that's what you call it. And that's why those two lots, you can't have an access point. Um, and then there's some expansion opportunities. So if you existed on before 2013 or January 2013, you could have one point of access on two Rod Road if you had something there. So those two properties that don't, don't have access unless, I know this gets kind of in the weeds, but the only way for them to have access or to be used is if the owners of the speedway combined those two lots and then took access from home. So if it became one big parcel, um, you could use that land, but you would have no access on two rod road for those two large parcels. So the properties that are now there, there's some opportunity for them to expand a bit, uh, up to 20%. But once and you can change your use to um, the general business if you're on two rod road, like you could turn your home into a commercial beauty salon. But once you ex you do that and you lose your residential, you can't go back. So it once you move, it goes. Uh, but once you another kind of thing, then notice she could add on twenty percent to her home to make that business change. But if she wanted to add 25% to the structure, she could no longer access to Rod Road. So there's a lot of uh, protections built in. It's just, you have to go through the details to figure it out, um, to really get there. Go to the, go back, <laughs> keep going. Next, next. I don't, you're going back. Go to slide, there we go. Uh, so this is the uh, rural family specifics uh, that I included in here. And again, it's applicable to just those parcels that were in the shaded green. Um, and it was for the land and the buildings in existing when the LI was putting in place. So it basically was set up to let those residential properties remain in conformance. You know, a lot of times when you go to sell a home and you have the wrong zoning, you're not in compliance, hard to get financing and those sort of things. So this was put into place, I believe, really to protect those homeowners from those potential changes. But it also gave them opportunity to uh, reap greater benefits if they wanted to change the use of their property. So it gave them some options. Um, I go back. Um, so again, the properties remain RFO until the property owner files the town that they want to change it. And then once they change it, it can't go back. Um, but you can see there's some things like small businesses, home businesses and those things are allowed throughout the city. So they can still use those normal uh, parameters to do some things. Uh, but once they change it, it can't go back. So now you can go to the next one. Well, Adam, I have a quick question. Um, if someone has an RFO and they sell their property, can it stay RFO or yes. does it convert? It does so it convert, yes. Okay. It only converts when they come to us and say, hey, does Hamilton would have to come to us? Yeah. Put it in writing. Yes. Yeah. I want to do. So it doesn't um, matter who owns it. Correct. Okay. Ownership is not okay. a problem. And so, again, if 
frame these questions in the beginning. I know I went through this pretty quickly, um, but the real questions are, do we, uh, is with vehicular access on two rod road, is it appropriate to keep those green RFOs in the light industrial overlay? Uh, should we read it? redraw the boundaries, if you will, to remove those because it's really set up for uh, two rod road to remain lower impact or do we leave it alone and let what happens happen and knowing that we've somewhat protected <clears throat> those residential properties um, because of the limited access on the two rod road. So if those two properties that are first down now sell, they'll have to be combined with some other property onto Holmes Road to even develop. Because as it is now, they don't have a way to get an access point uh, to Two Rod Road. Is that fair? You know, those kind of things are the questions, I think, um, that are, we're looking for this committee to give us some guidance on. Um, so go to the next one. So this is sort of the way I see we leave as is, we take no action. The committee says, no, it's, it's a little tricky, but I think it's working. I think it's accomplishing our goals. Um, we amend the language. Maybe if we, um, if the town wants to be able to have access to that, uh, those large properties or the residential, maybe we amend the language to make that possible. Um, or we could amend the boundary. So those are the really the three ways that I see three things that you're looking at. So leave it as is, work with the boundaries, or work with the ordinance. Um, so can we, I hate to make you go back. <laughs> can we go back to the map that shows where the, the orphan lots are? This one? Will this one work or you want to go back? Because uh, I'm looking at a satellite picture too. Just Yes. To orient Go back to the first one, Eric, yeah. where it has the. Uh, I'm going to draft. <laughs> Poor Eric. He's like, oh, and you all, it's Eric's birthday today. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 Is there a way for the ZBA to address any of this if needed? The only thing that they would be able to address are the home businesses, lot setbacks. They can't do anything with uses or access or things like that. It's specifically in the ordinance does not allow that. Okay. So. Although presumably we could make, um, we could create special exemption uses. The ZBA, that would get to the changing the language of the ordinance. Right. Or, yeah, right. I think you would be better suited to maybe do a special exception or conditional use or something yeah. that didn't have to prove. I mean, you obviously have a hardship if, you, if the ordinance right. is written, but there, it's not a hardship. It, it's a self-imposed sort of hardship by ordinance. So it seems to be uh, that we'd want to change the ordinance more than that. I wasn't thinking so much of use as I was access. I, right. And that's kind of what I was. I don't think that that would be an appropriate use of the BBA for access. Right. And, and on, can I ask what's motivating the discussion at this time? Uh, we've reached that we've had some concern from the public and some okay. um, issues about traffic and what's going to happen out there and the uh, well, status of the speedway. Can I jump in? Maybe this is We'll also have something to say, but when we talked about um, that trailer use rental that came through planning board, um, I had a conversation with their town attorney because I think the public had brought up some of the language in here that even that lot, um, which does have access in Holmes Road and, it, and is allowed, some of the language in it, um, I would say Phil Saucier was saying, well, if it should maybe be modified depending on the intent. If the intent was that trucks could access Holmes Road from those sites and then they were good, it's written in a way that almost implies that they can then not turn down two rod roads. So then essentially you're asking the police department to enforce that 
trucks from the west can travel down to Rudd Road, but trucks from those sites on Holmes Road cannot. So that's where it was like, he's like, I understand the intent, but it could be, it's just language that might just want to be cleaned up with the intent. Yeah, obviously, we don't want the police department to just pick and choose which trucks can go down there. When road. you say the west, <laughs> which way is west? Oh, to the left, a plan left is like say those are all the gravel pits and things are like we talk about right. like um to like i'm thinking buxton forum North side of town yeah. Holmes road is basically east west it's an east west, west quarter yeah okay. i'm so sorry the, I'm, I'm challenged <laughs> and that's the two where i is, is north south so um well yeah so a lot of the plan west let's say <laughs> if you look at it that way so so, so the issue is trucks coming west on Holmes road I think the no, that's no. not the issue. The issue is how the wording could be interpreted multiple ways, and that was the question that came up. The planning board, I think the planning board is thinking the intent, or the town attorney is thinking the original intent, intent was that your driveway is allowed on Holmes Road. How it can be interpreted is that any access of vehicles leaving that Holmes Road site cannot go down to the Broad Road, right. So it's that's that was something that Phil Saucer was saying. He was suggesting maybe some language change, right? Because it doesn't make sense for the police department to kind of pick and choose. So you know, can we just ban truck traffic? And that's a whole, whole other, yeah, no, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but is it can, can we have that as part of this conversation? Because that seems like a, a fairly straightforward. I think, I think it can be. Uh, although I guess I would ask this group. I think the intent was to get. What is the intent of the ordinance? What What do you want to happen in this area? And then we can kind of work through. That's kind of like secondary of after the intent. Then what are the things around it to make that make sense? Right. So that's like a step two. Right. right. But so let me just just weigh in here. So if the public is saying we don't want big, fast trucks driving up and down to Rod Road, that seems pretty simple. And I I know that doesn't address the question right. of what's the intent of the zoning, but it does seem to me that. And again, I'm not proposing solutions, but I mean, we're close enough to the turnpike, you know, entrance there. And Holmes Road is, you know, already established as uh, okay for truck traffic. Can't you just, you know, just say no, no commercial right. vehicles allowed on two road road or no truck traffic? Actually, since we've now, since the, 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 the intersection of Holmes Road and Queen Road has now been upgraded and, and it's really designed to be more facilitating to commercial traffic, that seems like a no brainer. No, yeah, a pretty simple, straightforward response thing. And again, but it the, does affect the two parcels that Autumn's talking about. So, if your intention is to have those light industrial on those two lots on two Rod Road, yeah. that changes the conversation. So that's why it's hard to the intent. What right. do you want to do? They would have to do an access somehow or yeah. other. Right. On the whole they they move to the right. 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 Or they could develop. And there, I think there's a lot of constraints on those two properties anyway. They could right. develop as rural farming still and single family. That's what right. I think. Um, but yeah, they would have to join access. And I think if, if it sounds like you all are comfortable with that and those two sites having to have that north connection, um, then uh, we can we, I add one other thing. This is just living up in this neck of the woods on Warm Road. And I know the intent of the main turnpike bypass is going to be to take traffic off from 114 in particular, which I live on. But I have concerns about big trucks coming in, even down Holmes Road, you know, from up Buxton Way and coming down through. I mean, and I know that's probably a future uh, discussion, but to me, there's no reason trucking can't just use the start right. But that's just my spiel for today. I think that's right. But, but if you keep in mind, Holmes Road then goes over to Beechridge and, and to, um, ultimately to Broad Turn. And there are the, the gravel pits and all that over there, and, and ultimately access to oh, industrial sorry. areas over in Buxton and Collins. <clears throat> well, they can find another way. Are there any weight restrictions on Holmes Road west of that intersection? Uh, not, not, well, it ends up getting out of mm -hmm. contact. So once we're out of contact, we need the DOT roadway. And yes, there, there are no restrictions, and not even well, in the spring, they don't get posted. Those are DOT roads. Um, I think, you know, there's a bigger picture here 
concerning the residents of Two Rod Road. So on the west side of Two Rod Road, where, where it's marked Two Rod Road, that is all rural farming. It's all single family homes. And on the right side, it's the light industrial with partial rural farming overlay. You know, if I were on the left side of Two Rod Road and that whole right side was developed in the light industrial, I would not be wanting to look at commercial buildings, whatever it may be. You know, it's it's a it goes against, in my opinion, the good neighbor ordinance. It's not going to maintain real estate values. I mean, even the proposed um, development in the old Beach Ridge property and across the street, which I question the parking lot shipping containers being an approved use. Um, it is not a storage facility. I've confirmed with the town manager of what that definition is. And storage facilities are fixed buildings like what's up on Running Hill Road or down on Broadway in South Portland. These shipping containers are made to be removed, moved, moved to other locations, brought back. People could store there, store somewhere else. Um, I, a couple things. We don't feel that this area, you know, that you've got one half light industrial, the other half rural farming, two rod road is not your average width road. It's not a 50 foot wide road. It is two rods wide. So you're 17 feet short. And, you know, a comment had been made some time ago, oh, well, we can widen the road. No, that's not the answer. You're going to take eight and a half feet from each side of the road, which then is putting my leach field in jeopardy because we had to get approval for placement of our leach field um, because we were very limited on where it could be because where it originally was, was practically on our neighbor's property. Um, but that was back in the 50s when things weren't developed. Um, you know, we also, as mentioned, um, you know, having to ride posted as a no through trucks local delivery only. There's, you know, you've, you've got Grandin, you've got Dayton Sand and Gravel, you've got Rispera, you've got Tim Pagan, you've got all these companies just flying down. You've got Scarborough Cross Country using Two Rock as a training point. And I fear for their safety. I can no longer walk my dogs down the road because I have been almost hit on multiple occasions. We have lots of children across the street in Kennebago. Um, adding industrial buildings is not an appropriate area. And if, if we had possession of the home we're in, which is a family home that is, if this was land owned by J.B. McConnell, who is the founder of Beechridge, who is my husband's late grandfather. And we didn't take possession of the family home until just after the changes here when my father-in-law passed away. Um, because believe me, I would have been at the meetings, but the neighbors there, they're not, they're not up on, on what their rights are and, uh, you know, in speaking. And a lot of people, a lot of the public don't, don't want to speak because they don't feel their words are heard. So right now, is that road used for, um, for industrial trucks? For oh, there are, they use it as a pass-through. From yeah. homes down to pain, pain back to homes. So I mean, it's and where's the restriction? Then? Is there a restriction? But maybe not tractor trailer. Not until no. winter time. Right. Oh, to wait on that. Okay. Yeah, that's why having no trucks may make sense. On two and when Costco gets put in, <laughs> or or whatever you know, Beechridge ends up doing, um, it, the traffic is going to be worse on Holmes Road. And which makes the two rod road, the dresser road, the dresser roads wider, um, you know, and it's more open. But it's going to make the traffic much worse, I fear, on our road and much more dangerous. And, you know, we've, 
we've given, um, you know, and, and the speed is, and lowering speed limit doesn't help. People think speed limit is suggested. We all know that. Um, you know, we, we have made the offer to the police department to park in our driveway because people will think we're just doing decals on the cars. <laughs> and uh, they could, they could get a lot of people doing burnouts, ruining, ruining the nicely paved road. So, and, and again, I do appreciate you bringing this topic up. No, thank you for coming in and commenting. It, it, it enlightens us as well. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. It enlightens us as well as to the issues. So thank you. David, it might be helpful to remind that uh, we have some folks who were there in 2013 and then, and then new members, but um, if I recall, time ago, but if I recall, um, in 2013, the way the process went is the, the Long Range Planning Committee did go out to the area to, to meet with folks. And in fact, that's how the overlay came forward is some people, they had the option, some people did want to keep um, the residential. So I just want to make sure that, that people knew that we, the committee did go out to um, talk with the folks. Um, it wasn't just a general public hearing. So um, I think we tried to work through some of those issues. Doesn't mean that the situation hasn't changed, but um, did try to make a, I think the committee made a good faith effort to working with the- I remember the we landlord. took a bus trip. With yes. The yes. Dan yeah. Day driving out yeah. there, so. I remember yeah. the trip. Yeah. yeah. So, comments, yeah. <clears throat> the landlocked properties, these are questions, clarification question, are for sale currently? I believe so. There is like, an yeah. available, in, available industrial land sign. No yeah. phone number, it's like two broad, two broad, R-E. I don't know. Some, some well, that, that, that's, that's more detail that, that, that I'm asking about, yeah, but I appreciate it. Say industrial land available. Are, are the owners of the property seeking relief? I have not had any conversations with the owners of the property, no, sir. So and they're I'm, they're good as is. I have not had any correspondence. I don't think anyone has. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to call that good as is. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. But in reality, even if they sell it, you can't access. Correct. Right. Yes. As as industrial. And so um, what would typically happen is you have these landowners that have owned it for quite some time. They're going to sell it. And then those developers, before they close on the property, will come to the planning department right. Right. and ask these questions and have a pre-app and we'll say, BTW, you don't have access. Right. You're going to have to go north. And then they're going to go back to the property owners and say, hey, you didn't tell us you didn't have access. Light industrial exists, but we can't. So no deal, or we're going to have to, or they'll come to the council and ask for some sort of relief or some changes. So we won't hear probably until they get to that point where there's some sort of contract on the market. So I, I just want to understand, I'm, I guess I'm thinking of an overly simple solution, if that could be the case. <laughs> um, <clears throat> If those two pieces of property were physically removed from the overlay and made residential, let's say, <clears throat> that's all that would be required in order to physically access those two pieces of property and make them buildable. They're buildable now as rural farming. So they can be residential now. And you can build an access on the two rods. Because you can have the access. Yeah, yes, yes. You can figure that part out for those but, uses. But because now you're doing residential in a light industrial zone. Well, and so, that's the way it is. It's rural, it's resi it's rural farming. Rural farm it's, farm overlay. it's an overlay. Okay, it's so, like large lot. All right, residential. so if you made it, if whoever purchased it made it residential, no issues. Yeah. Okay. I just, I have a problem with unaccessible sure, property sure. for the landowner as well as other issues, but I also know the road and appreciate that we don't want 53 foot tractor trailers riding up and down. 
it's a very narrow road. And then if, when you cross the turnpike, there's just tons of homes on that yep. side yep. before you get to pay. So there's really, there's the existing condition right now, which is Miss Hamilton's point that there's truck traffic there now. And it seems like you all are in favor of let's limit right. truck traffic onto two rod road as <laughs> the current fix. And then there's potential future impact that this is some light industrial. And to her point, there's rural farming on the west side, yep. there's light industrial on the east side. Is that the intention? And that was why one of the, the options was to adjust the map or to figure out the line. Is that an appropriate location for that light industrial overlay still? All right, but if you if you limited truck traffic, in essence, you've accomplished that. Right. And you almost force somebody to take and make that residential type property. You do, um, but it's not extremely clear. So you still have people that feel that their property is in a light industrial zoning, which it would still be. You're sort of, you're fixing the problem over here, but you're still letting them have this option over here. So it's not really clear. And I think to the, to the attorney's point and everything, it's, it gets a little muddled. And then I think some people have some. Uh, so two things, right? <laughs> Limit the traffic and take it out of the light industrial zone. A uh, question about sewer access. Yeah, I don't think there is sewer. There's no, no. Yeah. public no. infrastructure. So and what are they doing about the LI then with sewer access? Well, that's why I I think originally when the Long Range Planning Committee looked at this, that was one of the issues why it was made like industrial thinking, you know. Someone would bring the sewer. Right. And that you couldn't, you, we, you couldn't do full industrial without that. Yeah, of course. Right. Exactly. Just to be clear, the, the, the Holmes Road side of things, I mean, has traditionally been used for non residential, non rural uses. It's right. been, um, I mean, I suppose you could say that some of these uses are traditionally rural and that um, used car uh, parts lots are <laughs> often located in rural areas, but I mean, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a farming activity. Um, Restrict. A racetrack, not a farming activity. Um, and that big piece of the, the, the two part parcels on the corner of Two Rod and, and Holmes are both open and, you know, they're they're laid out for, for rural farming. Well, they're they're not laid out for farming. They're, no, but there's no suspicions there. Well, not on, the, not on the north side, the, the two on the east the left side of Two Rod path. No, I'm talking about the right side. Oh, yeah, the right side. Um, so on, on the beach and speedway side. Oh, yeah. okay. No, no, you're right on the other side. Because a part of this, I think, the issue we have is there's a challenge whenever we have a boundary between two very different use zones, and that that just we will never get away from that. Um, which is and 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 so I'm wondering if you know there's it looks like there are like three properties that are not in the rural farm overlay that are in the light industrial. Are those residential or what are they're residential, old residential. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering if maybe part of this is we extend the residential to those three properties on that side. You're going to still have the problem with that property north of Holmes and south of Holmes on the corner. Those really have historically not been farming <coughs> or residential properties. No, I understand that. Yeah, so, um, that. And, and you're going to be bordering them. So they're right. kind of. What I'd like to see is more, I would like to see more. Um, uh, for the light industrial, specifically, um, well, I it's in the past, but more definition of the exact approved uses and sizes of buildings in a light industrial. Because I think it said somewhere um, small. Well, but then we had that long list of um, Holmes Road access uses, which are quite, which are different yeah. than the light industrial uses. So. We've sorry, got did, oh, sorry. I just want to point a clarification on, on some of that. If I remember correctly, and I, it's possible that I don't, um, we should go back and look at our uh, notes maybe from, from then. But the residences were given a choice. Like, do you want to be in the industrial right. zone or do you want to have this option? And so I think that's why those parcels are in the light industrial because at the time they chose that right and the others chose this 
But I, I, we should go back and look at our notes. Yeah, that was I my talked to those three families, yeah. and all they've told me was that they had received the letters for public hearing, but they've said nothing about being given an option. And I know my father-in-law was down south with us during a lot of these discussions. He was down south with us, so he wasn't. I know he wasn't spoken with of choosing to stay. You know, to have the RF. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, I obviously okay. wasn't there. I want to kind of yeah. roll us into a conclusion here, Barbara. You had your hand up. No. Uh, yeah. but my question that about the obvious, I think, is still a question. Uh, the light industrial area is light industrial, not to say in name only. However, it is only light industrial if an abutting property owner in light industrial were to purchase it, correct? So it does give the property owners that option for sale. For those two pieces. For the, yes. However, in all practical purposes, if the abutting light industrial property owners don't want to purchase it, it's residential or rather yes. rural yes. farm. Yes. Right. I don't see a problem here. I mean, is is my conclusion. I think, I don't know if it's our business, what the traffic is on a particular road or not, but that does seem to be a problem. And there's nobody making an appeal otherwise. So as again, stating the obvious, framing the subject in a certain way, uh, for my own understanding. Yeah. Well, I kind of, I sense, I, I sense an intent here amongst the consensus amongst the people about the traffic and limiting the use on this property. The, the, I think the narrow chance for long, for light industrial is if there's an easement or some connection through the properties above it, which seems like a real stretch given the configuration of all those properties. Um, so I guess my inclination is, is not, not to do anything at it. If we can have influence on how the traffic is restricted, that would be one thing, but I'm not sure there's much to be done here. I think we would we would take it forward to public safety discussion. Then well, that point. I guess that's why I want to speak to the traffic piece. I guess I do think it's still too kind of, I understand they're, we're talking about it as a whole, which is great, but they are two separate processes. So if you guys figure out, like, as far as the intent and the zoning, um, in order to make that restrictive for truck access, um, there is a whole nother, so it'd be another ordinance change. That's chapter 601, the traffic ordinance, um, which I guess I just want to make sure we're all understanding what that means. Um, to make that change, you kind of, you, you are opening it up so that every road in town can say, I don't want trucks on my road either. So it could right. be a bigger conversation town-wide on True. what we're adding to that or that 601 ordinance on, it would be a public discussion for everyone to chime in on, yes. I don't want a truck on my road. So I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> I would, uh, if this is any comfort to anyone yeah. as chair of the ordinance committee, I can tell you that we are ready to have that conversation. Okay. Okay. And, uh, We'd well, like to begin with getting some input from public safety. As another member of the old ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> traffic, traffic, go the traffic yeah. ordinance route to address the traffic okay. issue on two rod road yeah, separately. That's fine. And just want to make sure that my comment partner, is. I generally do agree on common sense issues. Okay. So, uh, I have a question. How many acres are, are those those lots that are 45? 45 combined? Combined. How about when it's 23? School departments looking for land. Just saying. No. I'm just saying. Seriously. Don't let Denise. I'm just saying. You can have a you can have manufacturing there, you can have a school, but I'm just no. So with 45 acres, we'll turn around. theoretically it would sustain 22 or 23 acre lots. Potentially, yes, it If it worked. All right. Well, I think. We've expended our air on this one. Okay. So uh, just, somebody else has some of something else to conclude. No, I it's a public uh, meeting, so I don't think it matters one way yet, but I do represent the public so shouldn't participate in decisions or discussions. Mm -hmm. 
One question here, though, if that's the case, shouldn't you mention that at the outset of the issue rather than at the end? Oh, we can't. Right, but it, you're making a disclosure. Actually, I think I've disclosed that prior meeting. But... Well, I would suggest going forward that if that's an issue, we should do that at the outset of the meeting. Or at least, yes. What difference would it make if it's a public hearing? Um, I think it would be. I haven't weighed in on anything. I'm not participating in the discussion. Yeah. So, I was going to ask about that at the beginning. Maybe I should, because I know that you represent someone over there. It doesn't matter. Yeah. We have a now we know. Yeah. So let me just ask a quick question and then I'll leave it at this. But does this mean unless you're deliberating or about to deliberate, that's the only time you need to make a disclosure? Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what your point is. So you're, are you, is it a disclosure statement that you're making? I'm just advising people that if you're going to make decisions or give advice to the council, I represent the owners of the Beach Ridge, former Beach Ridge Speedway. Property, so I won't participate in any position or discussion or recommendations that this committee might make to the council. Uh, I'm not an attorney, so I can't possibly respond to that statement. I mean, your so. implication of what you're saying is perhaps the body would not have discussed this today because I'm sitting here. I'm not suggesting that at all. Okay, so I don't, I don't think the disclosure issue uh, is probably. I'd be happy to discuss that with you offline. Well, I don't think I, I need to. Uh, well, um, I mean, I'm, I think I'm happy to be guided by yes. advice of counsel if, if, if uh, Karen wants to ask Bill Sauce, should members of the committee disclose conflicts of interest in a public hearing? And I think to your point, you wanted it in the beginning of the discussion. Yeah, that's my suggestion. And, and we can definitely in hindsight, it probably yeah. would have been good. And, in, and I don't think, but I don't think it's relevant. For big I think you you did not participate at all, and I think, but oh, yeah, I will definitely right. um, get back to you all if we have that sort of issue come up in the future. Disclose it in the beginning or at the end, or does it <coughs> give you some clarity on that? I'm sure we'll be talking about some other. Okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Sorry, what quick thing? I just saw a note come from Robin. On this, so I just want to make sure that was noted as part of the discussion. Okay. Um, uh, it popped up as a bubble on the screen. I don't know. Okay. And I see there are five. Oh, five. Yeah, exactly. I'm not, I'm not there. So, she wants to speak. Um, and, and then the other thing I, I, I'd say is if it's any help um, on the zoning board, um, when this sort of thing happens, we have disclosure at the beginning of the discussion item, not the beginning of the meeting, the beginning of the discussion item. And then just as a courtesy, we go on to the other side, the public side of the, of the uh, hearing room. So on, on for the for that item. So that's just uh, again don't you go down that just as a comment. Um, so, uh, but like I said, I, I I don't know how we mark that Robin commented um, because it was just a bubble that popped up for like twenty seconds. Can you? Isn't she a she, panelist? She should be able to speak. She, she yeah. Um, she's, can you guys hear me? Can uh, you all yeah. hear me? Okay. Okay. I just want to agree with Councillor Hamill's uh, point that when a topic comes up, I think we should all sort. Of Oh, uh, any of us perceived conflicts to discuss at the outset and that's all but I really appreciate the conversations that's been had today and and it, it for me I would appreciate the disclosures at the beginning of a topic thank you well, maybe Karen maybe at the beginning of every meeting we'll get we, should, we should ask does anybody have any I'll add that to the topic conflicts so of interest that that matters on the agenda and then yeah. deal with it that way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Uh, next item is uh, discuss and provide input on site plan requirements as it relates to single family condos. And, so this one uh, at our last planning board meeting, we had a subdivision amendment that came up. And a subdivision amendment generally deals with the lot size, the setbacks, and those sort of things, but it doesn't get into the details of the site plan. And so this one was special. It was for um, one single lot subdivision, but it included eight um, single family homes, micro homes, if you will, which were allowed by zoning. 
So we had a position where the planning board wanted more information than is required for the subdivision because they wanted to see how these micro homes would work. And the applicant, the request was made, the applicant complied, the subdivision went through, everything was fine, but it was brought up um, that we don't require site plans for this type of development. And so we, we don't actually require site plans uh, for single family or two family homes, which is, which is standard and that makes sense. Um, the highlighted in yellow is the exemption for those. But what my concern is, and I think um, the planning board's concern possibly is we're going to be seeing more and more condo regime style single family homes. <laughs> Um, and we also have this thing, you all have not seen it in Maine yet, but I fear that it is trickling through the country, but it's a single family for rent. And it's gaining in popularity. It's essentially a multifamily apartment, but it style where you'll have the pool and the clubhouse, but you'll have little pockets, little, con little cottages <coughs> of single family structures. Um, and so those would be on one lot. And the way our ordinances work right now with the definitions, those would not require site plan approval. And that is a big red flag, um, I believe, for the town and for the planning. Does this have any, um, or is this impacted by the, uh, the state law from last year <clears throat> on, um, uh, on, on sort of changes to the approval process and the zoning process for? Multifamily and, and for um, small living homes. Um, yeah. For the LD 2003 for yeah. accessory dwelling use, it definitely could. I haven't reviewed <coughs> it in regards to that. I was just more concerned about, and, and actually, it probably is a good point to make sure. Um, I think it probably would. And so this might be getting ahead of that a bit. So, and, and that's my only concern <laughs> there because I, I know there's a lot of change that will be coming because of that. and it seems like there's a bit of overlap between mm -hmm. this topic and that so it might be premature to kind of have a, a recommendation i don't know but I, i'm is. just throwing that out there and it might be right on time too to yeah, get in front right. of it rather than to wait up but i definitely think and ld 2003 is on my list of things to bring to this committee um the next few months because july next year is coming in fast yeah um, but yeah i think that you might see that and it could be that we could write it so that if it's a single family home and it's accessory dwelling, it doesn't, the only way, I think you'll see the way I've given some options and I think these would help us. Uh, so this is the ordinance language and then the red, I've given us three options to consider that I think would help us. Um, so the first just being very simple, the construction of or addition to single and two family lots, two family dwellings on individual lots. Uh, and their accessory building structures and areas for parking, those are still exempt. So if it's on a lot. Uh, the second option is the construction of or addition to single and two family dwellings not held under condominium ownership regime or single common ownership and their accessory lots. The third, I think is super clear and I like it the best because it's very, uh, you keep the existing exemption and then you add single family or two family dwellings developed under a condominium ownership regime or single common ownership or not exempt from site plan approval. And I think this one would be the one that we would want to take away um, to consider for LD 2003. Maybe that single common ownership goes away. Or I could frame it in the, the point is to not uh, hurt people who have a single family home and an accessory dwelling. So the the purpose is to um, the purpose is to make sure that if a developer comes in with ten acres and wants to put ten little cottages on it, the planning board has site plan purview to see how it's going to work, see where the dumpsters and the parking and all those things that we require for multi-family projects get taken care of because that's really what it is. Um, and then for condos, the same, so we can see access and landscaping and things like that. So this, this last option might be tweaked a bit um, in regards to LD in 2003, if that's an option that you all think we should move forward with. Um, staff is just asking for some guidance on this because I think the planning board was a little uncomfortable um, with not having that as a requirement when that was brought up. But they, the applicants were doing this because we asked them to, but they didn't technically have to. Um, I think they were a bit surprised by that. 
if, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I, I guess if I can weigh in, I, I like that fourth option with an LD 2003 review. Okay. Um, I think it's the clearest. Yeah, I agree. And, and um, I, I, I agree with you. I think we will be seeing more of these. I know there are a few of these developments down if you go down on Route 1 on a rental and that. Um, and uh, Dan Scott, I know, has a very large <coughs> yes. version of this for a nonprofit uh, 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 agent place community. So um, this is coming to Maine rapidly, and I'm sure will come to Scarborough. Um, um, for example, the two properties on Two Rod Road we just talked about could end up being this, and you would be surprised to find potentially this coming in. So I like that blunt, not exempt, but I just think we need to do a, 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 an overlay for the LD2000. I think that's a great point. As far as I know, Google Making has not finished for that's right. 2003 yet. It's June 2023 is when it's supposed to take effect. And, and if I could jump in, I'm on the Maine Municipal Legislative Policy Committee meeting. We just had a meeting last week or two weeks ago, whatever it was. And this is not done yet. So stay tuned. Okay. Like I said, I think the, the, that fourth option is the clearest. It definitely reflects what I think my guess is we, 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 we would say. It's just we don't want to be careful on before later. Between now, June at the final adoption, final language for the LD 2003. Are you suggesting that we adopt this language and then revisit it in nine months or later to update it? That's what I would suggest I would to keep us safe in the interim and then be prepared for the discussion when we do get the rules. Uh, I think that'd be appropriate. We could use this to add to or tweak a bit. My, my guess is developers will try to slip in things before yes. full adoption of only 2003 rules. And so this would be a protection against people kind of getting in before the deadline. So this would be a recommendation to the council to go to the ordinance committee and update ordinance. Yes. So, um, yeah. again, it's two of us here. Yeah. 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 The ordinance is <laughs> <the> town council. <laughs> <laughs> My only thought is the uh, you know, implications of sewer or non stewarded land. Uh, two Rod Road, I think, would probably be impacted most by the fact that it does not have sewer, uh, public sewer there. So that would limit. Ultimate. That's right. There's no water. There's no either. water. Right. Right. So yeah, that's limiting for anything. Because right. I know there's a few places with water, but not. Yeah, anyway, I think there's consensus. consensus number four is okay. the road. So since we have two members of the ordinance committee, does this have a permit? Yes. Send us. Send some over. Okay. Great. Right. Pardon, I'm confused. Is the is okay? the issue? On the site plan subdivision things that the planning board, these projects you're talking about do come before the board subdivision. subdivision no, right. And so you don't get the site plan detail. So well, there's isn't a better solution to amend the subdivision ordinance? No. Why not? You wouldn't want you don't want to mix subdivision and site plan requirements. Site plan requirements include things like articulation of the buildings and the layouts right. and Dumpster locations. So you would be mixing two very distinct things. Subdivision is the land, the easements. Right, I understand the, that. Yeah. But other other provisions of the site plan ordinance that aren't looked at under the subdivision yes. ordinance, yes. then why not amend the subdivision ordinance and additional review provisions that are are like what's in the site plan ordinance rather than have a subdivision go through both subdivision review and site plan. Well, everything goes through subdivision review for uh, lot development. And so if it's a subdivision, well, everything just about new is a subdivision, well, right? So it's got to be at least three, three lots. But you would not want to mix design standards with subdivision requirements that are very technical and required for uh, public safety. Safety well, wouldn't that put and the developer in a? I'm sorry, yeah. but put them in a disadvantage at that point. Like when we get a subdivision, it makes come back and knowing they have to come back with individual site plans. So in that essence, if you well, change that, that, they'd have to come back. They'd have to come forward with everything. Well, for the commercial subdivision, subdivision division of a parcel three or more 
commercial bonds. But even the condos. That's a subdivision. Then the, so that gets approved. Then if I buy one of the lots and I'm going to build an office building, mm -hmm. I have to come back and complain a site plan review on that lot. But I'm a little confused as to what the issue is. This, this is because there's just one lot yeah. and they're putting up to 20 homes on it. And, and it under it's, a single it's building. called single family for definition, but it's not really single family. It's not the intention of our single family definition. It is a common ownership or a condo regime. So it's got an HOA or it's got some sort of right. amenities. And so we have to, I would suggest that we see these, these are coming as single family for rent. It is, it is, it is a hot mess. It was a hot mess where I left because we weren't ahead of it. So I'd love to get ahead of it here, yeah. um, given our requirements. Yeah. Too, because you would, you would have a piece of property with 10 acres, um, and they want to put 75 single family homes on it, but they're all owned, they're all managed, they're all rented. But our definitions would let them do that under single family, right? And so I'm suggesting that we really strengthen that so we don't have to get in that position where we're were forced where they forced the planning board's hand and say no you can't technically ask me for those site plan details yeah. this is a subdivision and then they just go through their growth permit process and they get building permits and then we're all like whoa what is this thing that we didn't get to see um, but a, but a, but a, sing, a single lot with three or more units is a subdivision no, no. It, it's yeah. not if it's all it, but that's so, not what the statute said. And we, we, we generally review those larger projects. Like we're allowed, we're allowed to review those as site plans, like for AR building, for example, like those larger multifamily sort of properties. So um, that sort of covers that. Um, I think as Autumn's kind of talked about, this more applies to the single family, um, you know, in joint ownership type condo units. Um, and rather than making someone go through um, you know, if you're subdividing a 10 acre parcel into five lots, um, rather than going through making them do a traffic impact study, making them do a formal lighting plan, a landscaping plan, this would just instead allow for these condo projects um, for them to be reviewed so we can get, we can say, yep, we need a traffic impact study for that, we need a grading plan, we need a lighting plan, and it needs to meet all the standards of the site plan review ordinance. We can talk. Okay. <laughs> We may be talking about two different things, Maybe. and I think that's what it is. I, this like is more of something that you haven't seen much of. You haven't only seen one that I know of. It's more of what's coming. It's a national trend. But you do agree that if I have a single parcel uh -huh. and I'm going to put 10 single family condominium units on, that's a subject. No, 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 it's no, one no, single no, parcel. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can build the condos. That's, that's, just, that's, that's, you're just selling that's that. That's going to be news to a lot of developers. And the good news, I guess. That's, <laughs> that's why we want to get yeah. ahead of them. <laughs> but in, in, in rich place, I think the issue is if it's one building with 10 single family units in it, then that's a different thing. That is subdivision too. Well, thing. but th this is you're building single family homes, standalone single family homes. 10 of which are on the one piece of property. The way that we've written our, our ordinance is that a single family home structure is treated differently than a structure with 10 single family homes in it. You'd still have to do the subdivision, but you do, wouldn't have to do the site. So the way it is now, yes, if you wanted to buy one piece of property and put 10 condos on it, you're still subdividing. That's okay. still a subdivision. All right. yes, well, yes. That's what, that's, no, yeah, yeah. I, that's what I thought. I heard you just say 10 minutes ago, but it is. No, no, no. I'm sorry. And I, I think that's where it got muddled. So you still have to subdivide. But what we're saying right now, that's it. You just subdivide and you put your 10 homes and it's on. Reviewed it. under the subdivision. It's just reviewed under subdivision. And what I'm saying is if there were if there were criteria in the site plan ordinance that ought to be that aren't in the subdivision ordinance isn't the better thing to do to amend the subdivision ordinance, add additional criteria so that 
you continue to review that development under the subdivision rules, but you have these additional criteria that are apparently coming up causing concern to the planning. Rick, may I ask you what you mean by better thing to do? I mean, I'm, I'm well, not I'm questioning you at all. I just don't I, know I'm just saying is. if try to think of me. Say the subdivision ordinance didn't have a, a criteria relating to traffic, but site, site plan ordinance did, and that subdivision isn't reviewed under the site plan ordinance, isn't the better thing to do to add to the subdivision ordinance a criteria that says traffic is something we look at? I think it is. Right. I'm just using it as an example. Rather than say these certain types of subdivisions also have to be looked at under the site plan ordinance, so that you don't have a project that the board is applying to, that all the criteria that you want to apply to the subdivision is in the subdivision ordinance, rather than have two separate ordinances applying to the same. Thing. And I, I see your point, but the way our ordinances are written today, right. it's the opposite. And so this is the easier solution okay. to not, because we don't, uh, some some places have a unified development code where it's all together. We don't have that. And this is an easier uh, solution. I think if we were going to go back and try to apply site design to a subdivision, it'd be a much bigger, we'd be here for a year. With the word. That, well, that's it. We, I, I think we have the first step okay. to, go, to move forward with or just council okay. and wardens. Further discussion on understanding site plan versus subdivision for us all. Um, and I think we're good on that one. Unless anybody else has a closing comment. We're at uh, like 20 past, 25 okay. past now. Um, doesn't look like we're going to get to uh, the comprehensive plan priorities again, unless there's a two minute or two seconds. I can second. give you a little yeah. bit, just yeah. a couple minutes. So yeah. I just, I went back and I read all of the meeting minutes for the last year uh, and I went through your priority um, details and everything and I focused in on the top six tasks and what I really wanted to do a lot of these top six tasks the action was review development regulations review zoning they all kind of were very high level and so I wanted to give you some options what I think uh, the top six tasks just some different things that they really include, like bite-sized pieces, if you will, that I think we can tackle. I I also I looked at the commercial uses um, too that we talked about, and I I can spend a lot of time, and and I still will fixing what I think you know combining office and the board uses and whatnot. But I think at the end of the day, that doesn't accomplish a lot of the goals that you all said you wanted to do. Um, it, it's some, some house cleaning that needs to happen, but I think in order to get to some of these uh, tasks, you need to really uh, streamline and some options. And so I've just kind of done like what I would call a brain dump on what some of these things might be. Um, you know, encourage attractive mixed use centers in order to attract new business. Well, that's a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> and so just for example, and I'll just leave it with this slide, and this is kind of just a handout that I would love for you all to take away and do your own brain dump one for small bite-sized pieces. Um, but encourage attractive mixed use centers. So commercial design centers. We have some commercial design centers now. They are recommended, they are guidelines, they are not completely, um, I haven't been here long, but I don't see that we get a lot of, we don't get everything we ask for. Uh, and so really taking a look at those would be an example of how far can we push what we really want. Uh, residential design standards, not for single family, but for two family, condo regimes, design elements, garages, those sorts of things. We don't have those in place. Um, Landscaping standards. We have some, um, but they're they're pretty minimal, and they're again there are some guidelines, right? So they're in our commercial design standards right now, um, and they're a little looser than what you could have. Review the existing GMO for rural exempt affordable multifamily. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. uh, the on that reviewing the GMO the, the other night, we've yes. got a. Little subcommittee, yes, working on that on the council. Yes, so, yes. 
Well, should have been touched with. Okay. And so these are just these are just some ideas um, that all the different little bite-sized pieces of the elephant that get us to this task one, just my planning kind of experience. And so I just what I found is a lot of these cross over for a lot of these goals, right? So a lot of them meet many of the goals in the standard. So I just wanted to to have that discussion, kind of introduce you guys to that topic, um, just to kind of get that that I'm, thinking. I'm impressed with your grasp and uh, what you've taken in in the short time you've been here. <laughs> well, I, I just I love it here, and it's very clear. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, regarding Jean Marie, what you just said, is it appropriate, inappropriate? I couldn't quite get it to, for the long range planning committee to uh, think about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the more, the more minds, the better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Okay. So, yeah, I think our homework is to review the matrix, the addition to the matrix here in our tasks. Uh, for next month, and we'll further elaborate on on, on this whole item uh, to hone in on the things we really need to do. Um, we'll wrap that one up. Uh, yeah, yeah, Paul, that that really yeah, 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 I know Alan does too. So uh, mm -hmm. we'll just wrap up. Any staff updates? Other items need to. I have a. I just have a request. Yeah. Can we get uh, a legal opinion on conflicts of interest? Do with long range planning in particular. Since it came up today, I'm also um, wondering about membership and and like PACs that have to do with anti growth PACs and whatnot, so, or anything related to that. What sort of levels there? I can uh, offer an email from Aaron Rowan that I got on that letter, John. There. No, no. We, I, Stay out of it, Dawn. Okay. I, if that we could just get a, a oh, right, yeah. from. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And we'll send it out ahead of the meeting. Yes, right? that'd be great. Okay. I see four heads up there. Oh, are there any public comments? One oh, with me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got any comments here? <laughs> Dave, one was me. I just wanted to say welcome to Autumn and that she's off to a great start. Thank you, Robin. Are you all set? Public comment? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I okay. appreciate it. We're good. Then our next meeting is uh, first Friday of the next month. It's November 4th. November 4th. That's a great point. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Everybody, uh, all in favor of adjournment? That's a quick vote. Okay. I'm not a voter. Yeah. <laughs> left, so. <laughs> Two voters left. I'll vote for them. I'll vote on Robin. Robin. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate that. Thanks, Denise. Denise, why don't you want to school? Well, I get you some kind of school. I, I, I do. So we don't have a we don't have a, a process for that. And I think in hindsight, you ought to say, I'm not.